Hello, my name is Eva and I run the account Notation is Great on Twitter. So this is the second of two videos on NUMS. So NUMS were the notation system used to notate Western plain chant. And if you remember last time we looked at staffless NUMS, so where you don't have a staff, you don't have an indication of pitch. So today we will see what happens when the staff finally makes an appearance. So just to recap very briefly, NUMS are signs which indicate either one note or a small group of notes, two or three notes normally. And if you remember this table from last time, you will remember that there were regional variations, okay? Now, from the 11th century or so, neumes become more and more standardized under the so-called square notation, which you might be familiar with. So all these regional differences disappear to some extent, although some German variations were still very much alive. So if we look at this example first, so here, as you can see, we don't have a staff, we don't have horizontal lines, but if you look at the left-hand side, you will see that we have the letters C and F, so we know where the C and the F are, and we can more or less guess each of the pitches, okay? We have a certain idea of where each pitch will sit, although maybe it's not 100% precise. So this C and this F are clefs really, and later on the C and the F clef will develop from those signs. This is another example, and as you can see here, we start to have something that looks a bit like a staff. So we have two lines, uh, one in red and one in kind of grayish. And if you look at the left hand side, we can find the letters there again. So the red line is F, and the gray line is C. And again, we can more or less guess where each of the other pitches sit. And note as well, for example, in the second system, the F line is not continuous, so it appears and disappears when it's necessary. So here's another example. And here at last we have a staff. So it's a four line staff. And the staff is typically thought to have been invented by monk Guido d'Arezzo who was also the monk who invented the, the names of the musical notes as we know them today, okay? So here we have a C clef on the top line and we have an F clef as well, which is this kind of comma sign that you can see in the second line. So with this we can more or less read all the pitches. So if we start from the beginning, starts on an F, no, 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 so that B is a B flat, so B flat is pretty much the only flat that you will find in this kind of repertoire, so it's not a chromatic repertoire at all, it's still very much uh, diatonic. Something to bear in mind as well is that when you have a syllabic text, so normally each neum is one syllable, so you don't have normally instances where you have a pes, for example, which is two notes, and then each note is sung on a different syllable. What you have though, and you can see that, for example, in the first line, you can see that you have a number of neums, one after the other, on the same syllable, so that would be an example of a melisma, okay? So here's another example, and as you can see here, we've moved on to five lines. And we also have a number of different clefs. So we still have the C and the F, but occasionally we have other letters, if you look at the left-hand side. So for example, in the first system, we have E, and on the fourth one, we have D, and so on. So something to think about, perhaps, is how was rhythm and pulse notated? Well, this kind of notation doesn't give us that sort of information in a precise way. So what musicologists think is that rhythm at this time was free in a way, so it was very much dictated by text. So with plain chant, it's all about communicating the text, it's all about praying through music in a way. So normally the consensus is that the singer or singers could try to adapt the rhythm to the cadence of the of the speech. So you would, for example, maybe make some syllables longer or give them a kind of special accent to some syllables if they were particularly important.
As I said at the beginning, square notation progressively replaced uh, staffless neumes, so it all became a bit more standardized. And I wanted to show you this example from the so-called graduale triplex. Okay, so you might have heard about the monks of Solem, so the French monks who in the 19th century sought to renew, regenerate Gregorian chants, so they created a number of, of modern editions. And as you can see in this edition here, we have the square notation, but above and below that we have staffless neumes. So these neumes come from two different traditions, so St. Gallen and Laon, and they are in fact quite useful because if you remember my last video, staffless neumes aren't good to, in terms of telling us precise pitch, in terms of telling us rhythm, but they can give us some information about articulation, about mood, about uh, ornamentation as well. And so it can be quite useful to have that sort of information as well uh, when you read the graduale triplex. So there is one last thing that I would like to say about the news which is that the neumes were, of course, perhaps the main major notation system in the Middle Ages. And as such, other repertoires other than plain chant used the neumes or other forms of notation based on the neumes as well. And I say this because if you've seen some of my other videos, like for example, Troubadour and Trouvel music, you will have seen signs, a notation that looks very similar to the neumes, but you need to bear in mind that the signs might not always mean exactly the same. So we'll see that as well when I talk about uh, 13th, 14th century polyphonic music. You need to be careful. I mean, in medieval notation, you always have to look at the context. A lot is about context. So um, other than that, um, this is my brief introduction to news, and I hope you've learned something. If you have, I would like to invite you to consider making a donation to one of the charities that you'll see below uh, who are supporting musicians affected by the coronavirus crisis. So other than that, thanks for listening and goodbye.